All right. Welcome, everyone, to Value Investing Live. I am pleased to introduce our guests this week, Eric Heyman and Tim Kang from Olstein Capital Management. They operate as the Executive Vice President and Director of Research and Senior Vice President and Senior Research Analyst, respectively. As always, for those of you out in the audience, please do post those questions and comments throughout the presentation and let us know where you are viewing from. We love to see our international audience members out there. Keep in mind, though, we will hold those questions until we get to the Q&A at the end of the things. Now, without anything further from me, I'll go ahead and hand things over to Eric and Tim, and we can go ahead and jump into their presentation today. Great. Thank you, Graham. Um, first, I'd like to start and just say that, you know, we do a lot more uh, financial analysis of financial statements than spending time on uh, PowerPoint presentations. Um, so our method of forensic accounting and looking behind the numbers is an underappreciated and unique approach to investing that we feel is absolutely critical to stock selection, valuation, and risk management that has proven to be effective in accumulating wealth over time. To sh help show this, we will talk about the following in more detail, all of which are essential, and this is kind of our agenda for today. An organizational overview, uh, Olstein investment philosophy, and we will detail the investment approach and process. So our story starts with the philosophy and the process, which is based on the quality of earnings report. Uh, this is a report that our founder, Bob Olstein, pioneered over 40 years ago. The service performed inferential analysis of a company's financial statements, which alerted institutional investors of accounting practices and assumptions that were not in accordance with the economic reality of the business and had to be taken into account when forecasting future cash flows. The quality of earnings was one of the first of its kind and was not a buy or sell report, but made investors think about the reliability, sustainability of earnings of that company that they were investing in. So the quality of earnings principles informs and influences all aspects of our investment process, including idea generation, security selection, monitoring investments, revaluing companies, and sell decisions and we will get into more detail as we go along. So uh, founded in 1995, Olstein Capital Management follows an accounting-driven, value-orientated investing philosophy based on the premise that the price of a stock may not reflect the true value of a company's underlying business. So building shareholder wealth over time uh, requires proprietary uh, fundamental research and independent thinking, a strict focus on valuations relative to cash flow, normalized earnings, and tangible assets, and decision making characterized by extensive team interaction. And I think a solid team with extensive team interaction is one of the most important factors in, in implementing our philosophy. Uh, this is a snapshot of our organization as it is today. It's an independent employee owned firm, approximately 900 million in assets under management specializing in value investing for over 25 years, seven portfolio management team members, and we execute our strategies through these platforms, two of which are listed mutual funds. So an average of 28 years in the investment management business, uh, average of 18 years with Olstein Capital Management, uh, extensive team interaction characterizes our decision-making process. Another key factor in implementing our unique strategy is how we define our analyst roles. We are all generalists. Um, I don't want my analysts to just be thinking about a specific sector or a specific industry. We believe generalists have a competitive advantage. We are structurally, uh, we structurally eliminated biases from our process and can step back and ask tough questions. We are willing to go beyond to sniff out value regardless of a sector or industry. Whether we're listening to a conference call, uh, visiting a store, or getting your car fixed, uh, we as generalists are always looking for good businesses in multiple areas instead of just thinking about a specific sector. Sector and or industry analysts believe sometimes that they're experts within a specific area, and they may be, but that may limit their ability to see the big picture. We are not limited as generalists and can move where the value opportunities rely regardless of the sector or industry. So for example, 
One may be looking at a pharmaceutical company and may find that the undervaluation is not at the drug company level, but a manufacturer of equipment that sells into that industry. We could move to that undervaluation opportunity. Uh, and every analyst is able to go in whichever uh, area they find undervaluation. While every company is different, all have a common language, which is core to what we do, which is accounting. And armed with a strong, they're all armed with a, a strong accounting backgrounds. And as generalists, we could research a company without previously conceived notions of the business model or industry. We approach investing like a business owner. Now let's move into the philosophy behind our investing uh, accounting and looking behind the numbers approach. Uh, Olstein Capital Management believes the price of a company's common stock may not reflect the true value of its underlying business, Operating free cash flow is the lifeblood of a business and focus of a company's valuation. Strong correlation between long-term investment performance and error avoidance. An in-depth forensic analysis of financial statements and public filings help avoid investment errors. And we'll expand on each one of these areas. So first, uh, core in our philosophy is our observation that uh, the price of a, a company's stock may not reflect the true value of the underlying business. So in other words, there are various factors that impact the stock price, uh, where the stock price does not reflect that intrinsic value. So what do we mean, mean by that? Well, here are a couple of uh, factors that may help explain what we're talking about. So the first one is inaccurate or outdated perceptions. Uh, what do we mean by this? Uh, what is maybe commonly believed to be a company's business may no longer be true due to management changes or strategic changes or transformations, restructuring, mergers and acquisitions, et cetera. Um, an example of this is Shift Group, which is a manufacturer of trucks, trailers, and other products. Now, it can easily be perceived as a run-of-the-mill box truck manufacturer in a fairly mature industry. In other words, nothing really special and priced accordingly. But what if I were to tell you that uh, they were going to participate in a huge secular shift toward last mile delivery and was gonna, we're gonna get contracts from the largest logistics operators? Well, that's exactly what happened. And unco uncovering the intrinsic value involves more than just looking at a company's past performance or just the company description, but into the prospects of a company to see what the intrinsic value will become based on those future free cash flows. But if you maintain your view, the company's legacy perception or lump them into a category and didn't dig into the prospects of, in this case, their changing addressable market, you would have missed the stock. Another one is temporary issues or unique strategic challenges. And so what do we mean by this? A stock may reflect uh, the current troubles that a company may be having, whether it's because of some demand issues or transition in strategies, rebranding, operating issues, supply chain issues, or something else. Well, our forensic analysis helps us determine if those issues are insurmountable or can be fixed over time. So we look at those uh, issues to determine the true value of a company in under normal circumstances. So an example of this, this is Prestige Consumer Healthcare, which is an over-the-counter consumer healthcare product company that sells through retail stores. The changing retail distribution channel led to destocking of the products, which led to negative revenue growth. Now, looking through those numbers, we saw the actual consumption of the products was actually growing, despite what was being reported on the top line on revenues. And as the destocking ran its course, the revenue grew, uh, growth reflected the underlying consumption patterns, which led to outperformance of the stock. But if you only paid attention to the top line negative growth and thought that that was going to happen forever, you would have missed the stock. Another factor is unrealistic expectations. What do we mean by this? Uh, well, management uh, talks a lot and their aspirations may be overly aggressive or optimistic in order to please Wall Street expectations. 
So what this can lead to is possible overvaluation. And then as that unrealistic expectation, uh, expectation unravels, that stock may uh, plummet back to earth. A great example of this is Cisco. Uh, and back in the early 2000s, uh, management were saying things like, we can grow 15% per year for the next 20 years uh, and things like that. Now, we, we found this growth projection to be overly optimistic, and especially if you did the math. Uh, but there was hype around, hype around this rhetoric, and the stock became very expensive. Now, these overly aggressive aspirations then bled into bad decision making, bad acquisitions, and other impulsive decisions to try to back up that growth expectation. And ultimately, this led to repeat bad decisions and failures, and finally, underperformance of the stock as both the expectations and the stock fell back to earth. And interestingly, we found that that stock correction happened too deeply and made that stock compelling um, at a, a different point a number of years later. And we always like the underlying business, the free cash flow, the balance sheet, but that unrealistic expectations created distortions in the stock price that we were able to capitalize on. So another uh, factor is uh, factors that conceal potential growth. So what do we mean by this? Uh, a company specific issues, including raw material fluctuations, capital expenditure plans, uh, remediation expenses, an underperforming division, may actually hide the true value of that business. So an example of this is Equifax, which is a credit bureau company that, if you remember, had to suffer through a very public data breach. And as a result, they needed to spend huge sums of money for remediation, for updating their processes, spending on new technologies and other items, very expensive items, all related to the data breach which led to uh, underperformance and undervaluation of the stock. Now we looked through that temporary spending that was concealing the growth potential, knowing that that spending, while certainly patching up things related to the past, would give them a big boost in productivity and margins in the future as well. But if you were too focused on the past growth drivers or the temporary overspending, you would have missed the new phase of growth that Equifax uh, transitioned into. And last, just to touch on um, negative market sentiment, uh, or I could say negative or positive. What's happening today, people believe will last forever. Uh, in the last 25 years that I've worked with Olstein, or at Olstein, we have seen COVID, elections, 9-11, uh, fiscal cliff, financial crisis, internet bubble, um, earlier, I think uh, someone had said oil was going to 300 back in, in 11, um, only to collapse. So, you know, people always believe whatever is going on is going to last forever. And some of our best ideas are made during negative market sentiment um, or positive because our names or the names that we're looking at are out of favor. Um, because we don't act on emotion, we rely on fundamental analysis, we're able to pick through this, this market sentiment and find undervalued securities. And we believe a, a discount closing catalyst should occur within a two to three year period. And, and that putting time on our side, which is, a, which is a key and gives us a big edge. So free cash flow is a lifeblood of a business and the focus of our company valuation. Companies that generate excess cash have the potential to enhance shareholder value uh, withstand a downturn, uh, increase dividends, repurchase shares, reduce outstanding debt, um, uh, engage in a strategic acquisition, or potentially be acquired. So critical to our process or in our approach is we take a private equity perspective to public markets. And I always look at things as if we're buying a business, not just stocks. This changes the starting point in how we do a company and that we look at as if we own 100% of that company. We are naturally motivated to look behind the numbers and critically look at how a company makes money. We often ask the question, what would you do if you were the owner of that business? What changes would you make? What are the risks? And what are the strengths or weaknesses of that business? 
So our research and valuation process, like that of a private equity investor, focuses on the company's ability to generate sustainable free cash flow, the level of ongoing investment required to maintain and grow cash flow, and how much cash flow is available to investors. Unsurprisingly, uh, the firm has had over uh, 50 takeovers in the last 25 years. So a strong correlation between long-term investment performance and error avoidance uh, is forensic analysis, we believe in the financial statements, helps us avoid uh, errors by revealing the quality of the earnings, the success of the strategy that's being implemented, the sustainability of performance, and the impact of management's decisions on cash flows. So as forensic accounting and looking behind the number stock pickers, when building a long-term track record, we want to avoid costly errors. That does not mean that stocks won't go down or that we won't make mistakes, but we understand the impact of permanent loss of capital to the portfolio. Our experience suggests that errors hurt more than winners help and protecting the downside is key to long-term outperformance. Uh, we will take market risk, we'll take operating risk, we'll take interest rate risk, and there are some other risks that we're willing to take, but what we wanna do is minimize financial risk and short-term thinking because you're forced to uh, financially as a company. So our forensic analysis helps us understand the financial risks and avoid hopefully costly errors and steers us through tough times. So uh, now, uh, as we go through a little bit more of the investment process, I uh, will detail out exactly some of our steps that we take. So what do we look for when we look for undervalued equities? And so how do we apply our unique forensic accounting and looking behind the numbers method? Um, so this slide uh, lists some of the criteria we look for uh, when we screen our investments. Uh, but uh, Notably, we don't limit the scope of our search. Uh, we don't differentiate between labels and categories like value or growth. And what we try to do is we value businesses and look for 30% discounts to that intrinsic value. So we look for discernible financial strength, unique business fundamentals, competitive edge, the ability to uh, generate cash flow. But we also, it's not an exhaustive list. There are other things that we may look for as well including uh, essential products, uh, whether they have a high recurring revenue or repeat business, uh, look for their return profile, look for a higher return profile, especially over cost of capital. And of course, management integrity as well. So we look for businesses that have discounts to that interest value based on those factors. And then secondly, this is a, a deeper dive into the specific business model, like understanding the business. So what we're really assessing is we look behind the numbers is the quality of the business model and what kind of capital is required to maintain or grow that business. So we're really looking for good capital allocators that can manage free cash flow to sustain the business model. And as, as Eric talked about, you know, why do we focus so much on the free cash flow? I mean, again, this is, uh, uh, such an important point for us because we believe free cash flow gives management much more flexibility to do those things like weather downturns, uh, execute a long-term strategy, pay dividends, repurchase shares, reduce debt, uh, capex, strategic acquisitions, etc. Now we we believe cash flow is the lifeblood of a company, so we spend a lot of time assessing the company's ability to generate and allocate cash in their business model. So step three, uh, this is the part where we get even deeper into the company, now into the financials and all the filings that are publicly available. This is our forensic accounting uh, kind of uh, focus. And of course, value, our valuations are based on free cash flow and normalized earnings. So, for reliable valuations, we have to assess the company's quality of earnings. What do we mean by that specifically? So we make accounting adjustments, we look at transparency, we look at normalized earnings power, and then we determine if a company's accounting policies reflect business reality, which we're talking about uh, how much capital is needed 
uh, for that company, as we talked about, if whether they take repeat restructuring charges, they have off balance sheet liabilities, litigation, et cetera. And then we make accounting adjustments to eliminate management's reporting biases. You know, a lot of management has, um, has say in determining the level of reserves a company would have, the level of accruals, uh, the kind of depreciation schedules that may, they may follow. And then we identify factors that may affect the future free cash flow. So in this case, uh, we do a lot of scenario analyses uh, and sensitivities to various factors that may uh, impact them. Uh, examples including raw material changes, oil changes, wage changes, which is a big topic these days, and catastrophes, et cetera. So finally, within our process, we use our forensic analysis to help keep us grounded with defined cell signals in place where we distinguish between fact and opinion and measure short-term issues versus permanent impairment. In other words, we determine a reason to sell before we even invest. So for example, we would revisit the investment thesis if the intrinsic value is reached, uh, specific leverage ratios are not met, a material acquisition, management changes, um, and the list, the list will go on. Also, we look at a benchmarks uh, on profitability, uh, dividend policies, uh, lawsuits, and all that factors into how we're trying to pull everything together as to what we would pay for a business or how that business cash flows would be affected. By putting down a reason to sell, it keeps us grounded and accountable when circumstances change within a company. This leads us to good discussions about the investment. And I would say that that's, really key to what makes us good is that we don't work in silos. Everybody has the ability to express an opinion and to look at and challenge any type of idea that's in the portfolio or potentially going into the portfolio. Also, by buying at a discount, that gives us an extra measure of conservatism to help protect on the downside. This keeps us nimble and flexible to pivot when we need to. And you have to be willing to reverse on a stock if your thesis is broken. And a lot of people have a hard time with that and that discipline is essential to long-term performance. So this is the nitty gritty about our process of getting behind the numbers using forensic accounting. Intensive analysis of the financial statements, the 10 Qs, the 10 Ks, uh, the proxies, footnotes, shareholder letters, annual reports. This gives us a good picture of the capabilities of management the company's potential and the accounting policies, whether they're conservative or aggressive. We would rather spend time with the financial statements than meet with management. It is far more informative to see what management is doing rather than what they are saying. And we look at the assumptions and motives behind the numbers, which gives us greater insight into the effectiveness of the business model, the ability to generate returns, and the ability to achieve sustainable free cash flow. We believe there is more value in seeing the results of the numbers than listening to the promotional rhetoric of management. So there's a wealth of information available to investors in the public financial statements. And for those who are willing to take the time to read through it, uh, most are not. Uh, most people don't wanna take the time to do it, um, especially when stocks are going up. Um, they'd rather believe what management is saying or ride along with everybody else uh, in the herd. So continuing on with uh, this forensic accounting. Um, so in order for us to do this, we have to understand uh, what may actually distort um, economic reality in the accounting. So a couple of things, we uh, try to identify and assess those accounting policies, as we said, and, and, uh, and, and that may actually have an impact to how a business is valued. For example, policies on percentage of completion, uh, uh, policies on LIFO or FIFO inventory accounting, or depreciation versus capital spending schedules, or other revenue, revenue recognition policies, uh, pension assumptions, minority interest, reserve accounting. You know, all these are really uh, potential areas of a lot of distortion. So once we identify these factors, we make adjustments to reflect the company's economic reality and calibrate our evaluation models accordingly. Like for, for instance, if we see that 
a company takes repeat restructuring charges year after year, which management may say is non-recurring, we may adjust our normalized free cash flow down, knowing the propensity for the management to continuously take restructuring charges. So we need to factor that into our evaluation. Or conversely, if the company is amortizing and depreciating assets through their income statement, taking a charge, but do not need that same level of capital uh, as, they're uh, as much as they're depreciating, we may adjust the earnings up to account for uh, the true free cash flow that the business is throwing off, which may be higher than reported net income. So these situations may arise from whether it's uh, moves for capital efficiency or maybe some purchase amortization or other accounting treatments that we need to treat accordingly. The takeaway is this, is that uh, it is critical that you adjust numbers to reflect the economic reality under normal conditions. So that rounds out uh, and gives hopefully a sense of our forensic analysis process. So our process has led us to a lot of corporate turnarounds and business transformations. Our experience and due diligence has led us to better determine the potential for corporate turnaround success. Some of the critical success factors that we look for in corporate turnarounds include whether the issues are fixable or structural, is there a good balance sheet with good liquidity and solid free cash flow, what the culture of the company looks like, whether they acknowledge the issues that they are facing, and whether the management team has the right set of skills to navigate through a turnaround. We look for signs to uh, affirm that our thesis is starting to play out within 12 to 24 months. And what we're trying to do is not necessarily that it's, it's done in 20, 12 to 24 months, but that we're seeing green shoots that are starting to, you know, um, that we can identify that they're moving in the right direction from when a corporate turnaround, we believe, starts to begin. Um, we encourage you to visit our website at OlsteinFunds.com, and, and we have a lot of stuff on there on corporate turnarounds, accounting, um, how to go through a financial statement as to how we uh, approach it. And I think there's really good material on the website that if anybody wants to look at it further. So to sum up our investment process, um, hopefully this, uh, this uh, slide kind of gives you a, a snapshot of it. Uh, first, we did our screening where we used both quantitative and qualitative criteria to determine where, if there is any valuation gaps. Uh, and then we did our initial analysis where we dig in a little deeper to identify and ascertain how a company makes money, uh, what are some of its key strengths, where the risks are, and whether there are any issues that seem either structural or maybe temporary. And then we dug into the forensic analysis, and this is where we spent a lot of our time through the financial statements, ripping them apart, and then determining the company's true economic capabilities, which leads to our evaluation, which is where we determine what the company is worth based upon our proprietary discounted free cash flow models and run various scenario analysis. And this is where we also determine exactly how we see the company reach its potential or uh, its intrinsic value. And uh, as a group, this is where we have a lot of our interaction, discussion, debate, uh, hashing out to come to conclusions about the viability of the investment. And ultimately, uh, portfolio construction. And it leads to uh, determining the appropriate weight of each investment, assuming that it's past all of those filters and, uh, and seeing what the risk profile is and, and how it relates to other uh, investments in the portfolio. So ultimately the resulting portfolio is not one that straddles an index or has a basket of different stocks, uh, but really a collection of high quality names at very compelling discounts. And that's why we believe we had had very high active share. And uh, we can speak to each and every investment as if we are the business owners and not just stock managers. 
So I'm going to repeat this. Our method of forensic accounting and looking behind the numbers is an underappreciated and unique approach to investing that we feel is absolutely critical to stock selection, valuation, and risk management that has been proven effective over time. And I think in an era we're living in now where information is instantaneous and at your fingertips, it is more important than ever to understand the quality of a company's earnings that you own and not just, not just treat them as stocks. They are real companies with management teams, financial statements, products, customers, and real world issues. And we believe that businesses are far less volatile than stock prices uh, can be. And if you understand the accounting and financial statements, the dynamics of the business, the free cash flow, you could take advantage of mispricing in the market. Um, thank you. Uh, I guess we'll open it up for questions. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for taking us through that presentation, breaking things down step by step. Uh, I think our audience at this point should truly understand how you guys go about doing things. does look like we have some questions rolling up here. Um, we'll go ahead. Uh, Richard, we'll come back to your question uh, so we can jump in to a couple of these others while they're fresh, but we will make sure to hit on it. Uh, first question, uh, fortunately, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this name, um, but I will preface uh, our audience member's question uh, with one. So it seems like uh, the process for, for determining how to actually bring in an investment is uh, extremely in-depth, to say the least. And you guys go through multiple steps. Uh, what's, the, what's the turnaround look like from kind of start to finish of considering uh, something right off the top from a screen to actually bringing it into that portfolio? Um, it's a good question. Uh, and I'd love to say that there is a um, exact time. Um, you know, there's some companies that have, uh, you know, 10 Ks and financial statements that are, you know, 20 pages long, and there's other ones that are 200 pages long. Um, you know, so I think what it comes down to is the level of the complexity of the business and how easy or not easy it is to take time to really understand that company and make certain predictions on that free cash flow. Uh, so, you know, it's really, you want them to really understand, I and mean, I, I want my analysts to really understand and the team um, to really have a good debate. And I think um, it really it really varies based on the company. And I, I yeah, I think uh, as I can speak for the other analysts as well, uh, each of us have done, I mean, what we've just went through is when, when an actual stock that we find in the process by which it gets into the portfolio. But we do a lot of work, extensive work on names that never make it to the portfolio. And in fact, so we've, you know, I maybe just, this is just for myself, I probably track a number, probably, you know, 30 or so companies I've done work on over the decades that I've been doing this, where I've been looking and saying, you know, at the right price, following the company, understanding and valuing the business at the right price, I'll be able to, um, you know, delve in even deeper. And so um, it's hard to answer that question because some of them, some names I've been following for 10 years and we've never invested anything. Other names I've, we've gone in and out based upon, you know, what's happening with that company's history and uh, we've made money on um, just, you know, it, as, as we talked about uh, situations where we believe that there's a value proposition. And so um, it's, it's difficult, but, you know, as Eric is saying, uh, the more complicated a company is, uh, the more time, obviously, uh, we will be able to, you know, we have to spend on it because we really need to know our investments as we are uh, looking at it as we are the business owners and the business owners certainly know their own company. Definitely. And to hit specifically on our audience members question now, uh, if we were to put you guys on the spot uh, and ask you to both uh, accurately 
and uh, speedily, uh, to put it as a term, uh, evaluate a company. Uh, our audience member put out uh, Evergrande, for an example, to be on a, a newsworthy topic where they see a, a PB of only 0 0.19, but debt's huge. How would you guys, if you were forced to say, do it in an hour, go about kind of quickly evaluating a company? Uh, well, <laughs> I think, you know, listen, the, the first thing we're always doing is we're going to those financial statements and really trying to get an understanding. Um, the cash flows, the balance sheet, um, the, the income statement, and really trying to get a good idea as to, you know, what it is um, that it, are the drivers of the company. How is the company generating free cash flow? Is the company generating free cash flow? I mean, there's a lot of companies that we look at that we just, you know, you look at and you say, wow, their debt's going up uh, exponentially and, you know, they'll, we'll move aside and, 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 you know, go on to something else. Um, so, you know, when you get into a company um, like Evergreen, um, it, it's, it's very difficult to go in there and, you know, it's not going to take an hour. It, it's going to take a lot of time. And sometimes if it takes too much time, we might just turn around and say, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna pass on this one and, and move on to something that we feel like we can get a better understanding. Do you want to answer? Yeah. So I mean, it's far easier to say no than yes. I mean, if you can just look at what kind of criteria we look for. Um, uh, so, an hour spent, we're gonna ninety nine point nine percent say that's not for us, <laughs> and, and that's inherent in in, in the way that we. Uh, think about our valuation methods and our uh, methodologies as a risk management tool. You know, we don't, we, our stock selection naturally gravitates us toward uh, companies with great balance sheets and uh, good regulatory uh, uh, environments, uh, transparency in terms of the reporting, et cetera. I mean, if, even if you look at some of the headlines about what's happening in Evergrande, that's an immediate no no thanks because it can go up 30 percent go down 90 percent and we'll be like okay you know if so if an investor calls us up and says hey tim what happened i i need to be art, uh, able to articulate why and certainly eric and i and the other analysts uh we have those discussions why is a stock behaving this way what's the new information what do you think about it kind of pressing our our flesh and, and say, you know, is this new new information something that we've already kind of put articulated, say, is this a deal breaker? Is this a reason to sell? And that's the discussion that we'll have. So it's far easier to say no. And so an hour's work, uh, it's just not gonna happen. For sure. And we do have a, another couple of questions uh, further down our list that we'll, we'll hit on since we're on the topic right now. Um, obviously, we've, we've driven home the point of free cash flows kind of being core there for you guys. Are there any other uh, you know, metrics that you guys kind of immediately turn to uh, when looking at companies right off the bat? I, I mean, you know, whether it's looking at the, 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 the debt levels over a period of time, um, always the free cash flow and the, the working capital. Um, you're looking at uh, R&D levels. If you're an R&D company, we might look at that and see the levels of R&D uh, based on what the sales levels are. If the company's doing, you know, 8% R&D levels for a period of time and all of a sudden it's down to 4% or 3% or up to 12, we were gonna, you know, investigate that further. So there, there's a number of things that we're gonna look at uh, to um, see uh, which areas we want to spend our time with just to get a firm understanding. So when we start to build our cash flow model, we have a good idea of what's going on. Absolutely. And now we'll, we'll swing back to that first question. We do have our list. Uh, just to toss another name out there. Uh, Richard's asking uh, about discovery and uh, looking out into the future. If you guys want to hint on you know whether you see there's an opportunity there with some of these AT&T Warner assets coming in or if there's big risks in your opinion there? Right, well, um, the discovery business, um, you know, we believe it's a good cash flow generating business and that's really the, you know, the starting point. Uh, the subscription business uh, we think is a good business. Uh, we think the AT&T acquisition is gonna bring them uh, a whole new platform of, of, of shows and um, rights uh, 
I think I still believe that content is is king because uh, everybody is in search of content. Uh, so you know we're, we think it's a, it's a pretty favorable um, deal when it closes, but you have to monitor all along and then see what they can do and make estimates of what you think the cash flows could be and go from there because they're going to add some debt and we're going to have to monitor that as as it unfolds uh, as it unfolds. Definitely. And continuing on, uh, we have a couple questions in a row here uh, from FewTrack, uh, if that's how I pronounce your name there. Uh, asking, uh, when looking at companies, uh, we've hit on, you guys are generally looking at something that's at a, a 30% discount. They're curious uh, what that looks like today with what seems to be a, a currently very overvalued market. I mean, when and, and that's that's what I'd say is, is, is the most important thing is that you know, we don't look at the market and then say the market is overvalued so we can't find ideas. Where we're focusing on are individual businesses that um, are what we believe based on their cash flows are selling at discounts to their private market value, their intrinsic value. And I would say that if you go through our portfolio based on normalized cash flows, we're finding a lot of discounts that are selling at you know 10, 11 times uh, you know free cash flow or what we believe is normalized free cash flow. So yeah, are there overvalued stocks in the market? Uh, and that's what you know people say. All right, the market's overvalued. I'm going to stay away. I, I think there are a lot of undervalued stocks in the market. When people are focused on other things, there's areas that they don't focus on. Now they're getting a little bit negative on maybe COVID-19 uh, you know, related things. And, and I, they are legitimate issues. The question is, is that there's certain stocks out there that are getting hit because of this. And those stocks are undervalued based on what we believe normalized cash flows are. And that's where we're spending our time. And that's where we're, what, those are the stocks are the ones that we're putting into the portfolio. So, you know, we have a lot of stocks in our portfolio that are selling at 30% discounts. 20% discounts, some even more than 30% discounts that, you know, that's how we build our portfolio on a stock by stock basis, not on a, on a market, on a market overview basis. Understood. And continuing on a question from Praveen here asking, um, what areas, uh, if you care to hit at any specific ones, are you guys seeing good values on now, or if you guys are finding opportunities in areas over other areas? Um, you know, again, um, we thought we have stocks in, in the technology area, we have stocks in the media area, we have stocks in the industrial area that we believe are selling at discounts in the consumer discretionary area. Um, and again, when you're when you're building a portfolio on a stock by stock basis, as if you were buying these businesses, which we would buy, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of pockets of valuations um, across the across the board right now, um, and we're we're taking advantage of those because right now, each one of those has some type of negative sentiment around it that we believe uh, should work itself out within the next. Uh, let's say 12 to 24 months. You want to add on yeah, that? so, you know, actually, you know, as you uh, brought up discovery, that might be one that might be a little bit more public because we've seen the whole industry go through a huge transformation from, you know, traditional uh, TV type of programming to over the waves. And, 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 and of course, now we have the lockdown and everything else. And all these changing dynamics have uh, given a, a, the whole industry sort of a pause or at least investors pause in, in terms of looking at how to value them. And so, you know, as we're talking about discovery and, you know, looking at the management team, looking at the, the types of resources that they have, looking at the strategic uh, decisions that they've made, uh, those are the types of things we say, hey, you know, there is a macro element that makes maybe the whole sector a little bit down versus what historically we've been trading at. But, you know, we believe that this company specifically has some merit in terms of uh, and why uh, there's a, a discount to uh, what we believe is an intrinsic value. Right. And I think, you know, whether it's Discovery, uh, I'll, I'll add Viacom, um, we think these stocks are selling at almost probably 40% discounts to what we believe the intrinsic value is. Definitely. So it sounds like there are 
uh, plenty of opportunities out there for those willing to you know put their nose to paper and and really do the work yeah and, and take a take a different and we don't we're not contrarian i, I don't want to you know people to think that we just are contrarian you know each individual investment has to stand on its own when we build a portfolio um each stock has to you know be justified we review them on a with our 10 k's and 10 q's on a, on a regular basis that news comes out um but each business in the portfolio um has to stand on its own absolutely and continuing on to a, a question from eric that we have here uh, to hit uh, again on another, uh, we'll call it newsworthy topic here. Do you guys like Chinese stocks or emerging market stocks, or do you tend to stay away from them? Uh, our focus is really on um, domestic domestic equities. Uh, I, I would say that there's a lot of companies that we own that do business uh, in emerging markets and developing markets. Uh, so you know, but our, our our expertise is in in domestic equities and understanding uh, domestic equities. And I think the one of the key reasons why is that you know when we're looking at the forensic accounting, we really understand how GAAP works. You know, with all of our accounting backgrounds, uh, me as a former auditor, you know, understanding and relying on uh, how that U.S. GAAP. Uh, works is actually a, a critical element to that to be able to rely on the the, the underlying sovereign uh, government regulations. Um, having said that, I mean there are a lot of our companies that operate op uh, offshore, and so uh, that gives us exposure to emerging markets, to international markets, etc. But ultimately, we measure that through the lens of, of uh, the U.S. accounts. Gotcha. Gotcha. And a uh, question uh, from, I'm probably going to butcher this, uh, but Grenouve, I think. Um, interesting question here, uh, asking what books do you guys recommend or what do you guys like to read uh, on the note of investing? I mean, I spend a lot of my time reading Value Line. So <laughs> um, I, I think it's just got a, a wealth of information in there of names and you know, when you're when you're when you're constantly reading financial statements and you know 10Ks and 10Qs and they're coming out on a regular basis and shareholder letters and looking for for names, uh, you know that's that's the majority of the time. Um, you know, my time is spent uh, doing that. Yeah, I think also um, we try to kind of encourage not just financial but other ways. Of, I mean, our generalist philosophy of being analysts kind of speaks to that, saying, hey, you know. You've got to be curious. You've got to understand that great ideas may come really un unconventional sources. But you know, a book that's kind of a classic is, is called Disney Wars, and sort of the the the, uh, the power struggle of how that kind of the boardroom and the, and the C-suite uh, kind of uh, manifested itself in, in, in at Disney it was an interesting read, just to understand that there are people behind these businesses, that are, and it, which is again a, another fundamental view about how we approach things, we see them as companies, not just stocks, not just numbers, you know. But, you know, I spend a lot of times on like actually like financial, uh, uh, scientific journals and sociology uh, uh, types of, uh, uh, you know, essays and, and other things like that, which uh, I find to be very, very insightful. So I would expand outside of just even the financial. Um, and, you know, frankly, I, I think the, the last financial book that I was reading, I was looking at the Excel macros. Gotcha. All right. Well, on the note uh, of management and metrics, uh, one of the questions we like to ask here a lot, and I think we've driven this home, uh, but I'll, I'll ask if you can uh, put it on a, a percentage basis, but between metrics and management, Obviously, the, the emphasis for you guys is on metrics here, but when management comes in, how much, I guess, or what weight are you guys given to what management's been doing, say, in their performance numbers within those metrics? How much does it affect your decisions? Uh, I'll start. I'm sure Tim will add to it. Is, um, you know, I would say that... Uh, you know, when you're reading through a shareholder letter or a 10K or a 10Q, you almost start to do a report card on how management is doing and what they're saying. I mean, you're looking at the presentations, 
You could read any type of Wall Street research out there as to what they're doing. Um, and you have to look at it as, as what's realistic and what's not realistic. Um, I think Tim said it throughout the presentation is, you know, if you have a management uh, team that's going in there and, and they're doing constantly recurring versus non-recurring and this is it, but now we got to restructure this, uh, you start to get tired, but you'll see a pattern if you really take the time to look at it. Now on corporate turnarounds, uh, when someone comes in and says, hey, these are my strategies, A, B, C, and D, and then as it unfolds, and it doesn't unfold right away, sometimes it takes a little bit longer than what, even what we expect, you could really um, almost grade how they're doing as things go along. Um, and I think that by doing the, you know, the forensic analysis and really looking at those um, financial statements uh, and shareholder letters, you could really set up a good, um, uh, you know, checkpoint as to how management is doing and what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, um, as we were saying, I don't know if I would make a, a real quantitative delineation between the the, uh, the importance of management versus the, the quantity. To us, it's sort of one thing because it really is how, I'll make a baseball analogy. You can watch the swinger and look at the, uh, the, the you know, how he hits, how he kind of approaches it and everything. But the, the proof is in the, in the batting average. It's, it's proof in the, in the statistics, you know? Uh, it's proof, proof if, you know, at the right time during a game, you can actually step up to the plate and, and, and you know, get on base. So uh, to us, it's all really one thing. And, uh, and that's how we judge management and, overall. And I also think that it also depends on the price, the price you pay. I mean, that's really the key. What is the price you're paying for that business. And if you have to um, maybe bring the multiple down as to what you'd pay because you have a question, it's all about um, that. And, you know, as to assess as to how that management team is doing. So it's the price you pay um, that, you know, you kind of build that, that level of safety, the discount, et cetera. And that's how you, you know, kind of incorporate management into the overall uh, valuation process. Definitely. And looking down our list now, uh, looks like another question uh, from a name that I'm not going to try and pronounce because I don't want to ruin it. Uh, but do you guys uh, like buying into like investment holdings such as Berkshire, Alliance Bernstein, things along those nature? Or would you say it'd be better to buy ETFs on that note? Uh, first off, we don't buy ETFs. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, individual businesses. Now, whether that business is a, uh, a you know, a specific company, like a small company, or that is a conglomerate, um, you know, like a Berkshire, uh, you know, like a 3M that has multiple businesses, uh, you know, we're going to assess that business um, and take the time to really take a step back and look at what the cash flows are, um, how the balance sheet is set up. And what we try to do is not get caught up in a, to stress this is, you know, we don't get caught up in same store sales. We don't get caught up into, you know, we were talking to Bob the other day about, uh, you know, um, how many, how, you know, the airline, uh, it was overbooked yesterday and it's underbooked today. It's it's really taking the time to understand what, what the value of that business is, whether it is a conglomerate or whether it's an individual small little company. Yeah, and, you know, in terms of Berkshire, we happen to have uh, Berkshire Hathaway stock in one of our portfolios and uh, it took a really long time cumulatively uh, our collective heads because what we did was we valued the underlying investments that are in and but the reason why we invested in Berkshire overall is their approach is very similar to how we look at things but they, their access to maybe more private companies that we don't have access to uh, was something that was, that was uh, an extra compelling, but we've done all the due diligence underlying of all the business segments and investments to get comfortable with the overall investment. So it just takes an extra layer of uh, due diligence. Absolutely. And uh, a couple of questions uh, down at the bottom of our list that I, I think are, are interesting, uh, and at least related to our platform. So I'll go ahead and put them out there, obviously. We, we track some of the, the biggest name investment gurus, as we call them, out there across the industry. 
Are there any, uh, whether it be past historical investors or Buffett nowadays, that who we all know and love for his strategy, are there any of those big name investors that you guys followed growing up or kind of inspired your strategy or inspired to, you to get into the field of investing? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I've been with Bob for, for 25 years. And, you know, Bob was always someone that I admired and I understood that, you know, what his process was and the quality of earnings. So you know, I'm going to say, you know, Bob is one. Um, and there are a couple of other guys, uh, you know, Nigran, I think is a great, a great manager also. Um, you know, Barron, uh, another good, you know, big picture thinker. Um, not the way I do things, looking at the numbers, but I can't argue with, you know, how, how he has done. Yeah, and you know, I, I came to this firm uh, knowing Bob's methodology as well, so I would put him on the list. But you know, Bill Smead uh, is is a great current investor. You know, we've uh, you know even Bill Miller, the way that he kind of thinks out of the box, even though he's sort of in the value category, something that I that I look at and admire. Um, Richard Freeman, Hirsch Cohen, those guys, uh, I'm very familiar with their process and, and the way that they thought about things. So. You know, all these uh, folks that are out there, they take a, a, a kind of a different approach and I uh, respect that. Definitely. And uh, another interesting question here uh, from Dale Dal, uh, one of the two, hopefully, hopefully I'm getting that right here. Um, you know, as generally comes up here uh, in these presentations, it's easy uh, or easier to buy into a company versus selling it. And you guys mentioned that you kind of set up your not necessarily sell plan but sell criteria beforehand when you actually reach that point is it hard to let go of a company on the potential of it doing better um the reason why we put a reason to sell um is really just as a um topic so we can go out and discuss it um so you know as we're you know, analyzing the company and, you know, some companies we've owned for 15 years and others, you know, we reach the value relatively quickly. Um, so, you know, it, it's always, I would say, um, it's always, it's difficult to sell, especially when something's working. Um, but if we can't get the discount that we're looking for um, to hold something and the, the odds are no longer in our favor. So we'd rather sell it um, if we don't see a discount anymore and put it in something else in the portfolio that we're having a, a bigger discount in or move to cash. Uh, but, you know, each investment we have to look at and we have to make an assessment as to, you know, where we are and what's taken place. And a lot of times we'll take position down um, and then when it gets to full value, we'll sell it and move on to something else. And we'll also sell it if we feel like we're wrong and, and move on to something else. You can't you can't get emotional. And I think sometimes people get emotional and they'll, you know, write it up, write it down. And really they don't know what they own because we're dealing with valuations. Um, it's a little bit easier. Um, there's no reason to hold a stock that I think is worth 20 um, that's selling at 20. Um, I'd rather put it into another stock in the portfolio that's selling at a 30% discount or a 25% discount or a 35% discount. Because I think I'm always trying to set the portfolio up for the next three to five years, not just kind of ride out the ones that I have right now. I think, I mean, it's great that Grant brought up the reason to sell. I think that's a really distinctive uh, part of our process because what that, and, and Eric touched on this, what that does is it actually gives us an accountability uh, unemotionally. We're all human, you know, we're gonna be, it's, it's hard to sell, you know, but it gives, on black and white, here's the reasons why I would rethink this investment before an actual dollar of capital is put to work, where you know you're kind of emotionally uh, more detached from that process or that that investment. And so um, that has been an essential tool to to uh, uh, promote discussion, uh, keep our eyes uh, alert for various things that may happen in a company. And give us actually a platform which by you say, hey, you know what, Tim, you broke this down as a reason to sell. They wrote, and then Eric would say, you know, it, it's a, it's approaching that. What do you want to do? Let's talk about it. 
And so that that is an essential part. And it makes it easier to sell because you've done it less emotionally and you've already relied on that. And that's worked for us over time. Absolutely. Well, gentlemen, that is going to round out the time that we do have here today. We are buttoned up against that time match uh, at this point in time. Uh, I want to thank you guys so much for, for coming out, giving us this great presentation, taking the time to go through these questions with our audience. Uh, they poked at you, and you came back with great responses. So it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on today. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Absolutely. And for those of you out in the audience, if you missed anything today, came in late, anything like that, there will be a full recap here on YouTube as well as on GuruFocus.com. If you want to take a peek at it, go back through those slides, anything like that. Outside of that, we wish you guys the best. Uh, Eric and Tim, we wish you guys the best as well. And we wish everybody uh, good luck with their investments moving out into the future. Great. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you. Thank you all.